Hi, I'm a tub Chuck, a professor of medicine, I'm talking on Barrett's esophagus screening, surveillance, and therapy. Um, Barrett's esophagus is important because it leads to adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, a deadly disease that we've made very little progress on. And the attempt is to diagnose Barrett so we can prevent uh, development of adenocarcinoma or detect it early. Goals today will be try to cover all of Barrett's within one hour. Um, we'll start out first talking about the epidemiology of Barrett's esophagus and esophageal adenocarcinoma, and then talk into how that translates into our screening and surveillance guidelines and, and what rational strategy we try to use. And then if there's enough time, we'll touch base on endoscopic therapy for dysplastic Barrett's, which is the newest advance in, in this disease. Now remember, uh, Barrett's esophagus itself is really not a disease, it's more of a condition. And it's important only because it leads to cancer of the esophagus. And how important is cancer of the esophagus? Well, this year, there will be about 18,170 new cases. So compared to something like lung or colon or breast, not very common. Um, although the majority of these will be adenocarcinomas, uh, what does make this a somewhat significant condition to study is of those 18,170 individuals, most of them will die of cancer-related death. If you look at the stage-specific five-year survival for this particular cancer, it's still less than 20% overall. It hasn't improved much in the last 30 years um, compared to other cancers where we have made advances. And, and um, we talked about early detection as being a, a panacea for uh, cancers and prevention. And sure enough, if you catch a, a distant uh, disease, you don't really cure anyone. But look at this, even with localized disease, the cure rate's only about 40%. So our goal has to be not just early detection, but perhaps prevention of this cancer if we're going to make a difference. One of the other fascinating things about this disease is when I was a house officer, as we're talking about somewhere down here, these cases were presented at, at rounds because they were so unusual. And for some reason, over the last three decades, the incidence of this disease has gone up about sevenfold, much more than other cancers, which are actually somewhat, you can see, colon is on its way down, lung and maybe breast are on its way down, and this has been the fastest rising solid cancer, in, at least in this country. And whatever has changed in this country has also changed in the rest of the Western Hemisphere. This is a study from Denmark showing the rates of squamous cancer being somewhat stable, but adenocarcinoma going up very similar to what we see in the United States. And in parallel with that, as you would expect, uh, esophageal cancer deaths have also been increasing because we haven't made much of an impact on the treatment for this cancer. Um, so what is Barrett's? Well, Barrett's is the only precursor we know for this disease, and it's our one hope of trying to make some uh, significant impact on this disease. Uh, the definition of Barrett's has actually changed from decade to decade and, and is still different in this country as opposed to the United Kingdom. Uh, United Kingdom, uh, it requires simply just columnar metaplasia in the tubular esophagus. It does not require any histologic uh, presence of intestinal metaplasia, whereas in the United States, we require the presence of intestinal metaplasia. Now, columnar metaplasia is probably a lower risk of lesion, but will capture more of those individuals who are going to progress. A specialized intestinal metaplasia is probably a higher risk lesion. So the diagnosis has to involve endoscopy, where we look for this reddish change in the esophagus. It changes from the normal squamous, which is grayish, 
for reddish mucosa, but the biopsy from this area in the United States that meet the definition of Barrett's esophagus requires these intestinal type cells with these what we call goblet cells, this absorptive epithelium. Um, you cannot make a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus simply on endoscopic biopsy. And when you get a pathology report that makes a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, that's simply not the case. You have to combine it with endoscopic findings and, and histology findings. There's some important landmarks on endoscopy that uh, um, are relevant in all endoscopy reports. Uh, first, you have to know where the diaphragm is. That's seen as a pinch when you do endoscopy. Uh, you have to see how much of the stomach or the gastroesophageal junction defined by the proximal border of the gastric folds. And then where the squamocolumnar junction is, where you see the histologic transition. When the Z-line is proximal to the gastroesophageal junction, you have metaplasia in the esophagus. And if those biopsies show special, specialized intestinal metaplasia, you get a diagnosis of Barrett's. And more and more, we recommend using a, a defined criteria for measuring the extent of metaplasia using something called the pride criteria, which measure the circumferential extent and the maximal extent, but this is not found in most endoscopy reports. Just to show you endoscopically, this would be a normal gastroesophageal junction. This area is being pinched. You can see the Z line where the transition goes from squamous to columnar happens to be right at the pinch, diaphragmatic pinch, and the stomach starts below the Z line. So there's no hiatal hernia. It's a normal Z line. This is a normal esophagus. Where the problem comes in is in something like this. So this is a diaphragmatic pinch. This is where the diaphragm is. Now you've got a little bit of stomach with folds coming proximal to the diaphragm. So maybe a half centimeter, or centimeter hiatal hernia. And then the squamocolumnar junction is a little bit irregular. So is this part of the stomach? Is this part of the esophagus? And the biopsies from here show intestinal metaplasia. Is that truly Barrett's esophagus or not? And that's where the controversy and, and the difficulty in this disease is. This happens to be a very low risk lesion. And I, I argue that this should be left alone. But others argue that you have to look for Barrett's under every rock. This is a little more clear diaphragmatic pinch, the stomach coming up, folds, stopping right here, so the gastroesophageal junction would be here, and you've got these reddish areas that are extending proximal to the stomach into the true tubular esophagus, and if biopsies from here confirm intestinal metaplasia, then you do have a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. And then something like this is fairly clear. This is circumferential involving a large extent, long segment of the esophagus. This is more of a high-risk lesion for progression. Because of this difficulty in defining what Barrett's truly is, uh, if you look at different studies, the prevalence of Barrett's esophagus varies from as low as 0.4 percent to as high as 25 percent. Again, if you make the prevalence higher, then your lesion becomes low risk and probably not worth surveying. People get very alarmed. Oh my God, there's 10 percent Barrett's in the population. If 10% if of, of us have Barrett's, then it's really not a condition worth pursuing. So it has to be defined as something whose prevalence is low, yet it captures most of those who are at risk for progression. So what are the risk factors for Barrett's and adenocarcinoma? There's a number that, uh, of them that we inherited, age, male gender, white race, and family histories in red because it's something we've been interested in and we'll talk a little bit about these risk factors. And then there's some acquired risk factors. <coughs> So esophageal cancer, per se, is a disease of 
aging uh, disease as you get when you're older. And the mean age of onset of esophageal cancer, the incidence is about 62 years or so. Um, the incident age of Barrett's is not defined. We don't know exactly when Barrett's develops because there's no symptom and, and you only diagnose it when you do endoscopy. But the prevalence has been defined in endoscopy studies. And if you look at the prevalence in Barrett's esophagus, it plateaus somewhere around the age 50, 55, about 10 years before the onset of cancer. And, and that's our best estimate of how long it takes for the progression. But again, we don't have any good studies on incidence, so we really don't have good studies on the risk of progression. The other interesting thing about this condition is it's predominantly a male condition. If you look at studies that measure the um, prevalence of Barrett's in males, the ratio uh, in these three bottom studies is about two is to one or three is to one. And there's something about male gender that not only predisposes you to Barrett's, but probably also drives the progression from Barrett's to cancer because the ratio for cancer is somewhere around five is to one or six is to one. So the male gender predisposes you to Barrett's, but even more it predisposes you to progress the cancer. It also happens to be a disease that's seen primarily in Caucasians. A majority of studies, 90% of Barrett's and adenocarcinoma patients will be white. Um, there are some reports of Barrett's and adenocarcinoma in Japan, but very small compared to what's seen in the United States, Europe, and Australia. So this disease is primarily confined to, to the Western Hemisphere and Australia. And my particular bias is this male gender and race predominance represents a genetic factor, although it could be environmental since we really don't know what, what predisposes to these conditions. Um, there is some rise in Barrett's in, in all races, but as you can see, the rise is happening most in non-Hispanic whites. Now the condition, um, the acquired condition we most frequently associate with Barrett's and adenocarcinoma is heartburn or reflux. And the best studies, population-based studies, for adenocarcinoma come out of Sweden, where they have a, a national population uh, database and ability to study uh, at a population level. And this study from Jesper Lagergren, which is now about 20 years old, um, showed that those with heartburn had about an eight-fold risk of developing adenocarcinoma compared to those without heartburn. But the other significant thing in this study is if you look at those who did not have heartburn, 76 or 40 percent of those with cancer actually had no heartburn. So if you focus your screening strategies simply by using heartburn, you're going to miss about 40 percent of those at risk. The other thing that Lagerman found was it all components of heartburn, whether it was increased frequency, increased severity, or duration, all of those, as they became more severe, predisposed to the development of adenocarcinoma. That's not quite the case with Barrett's esophagus, which is the precursor. It turns out Barrett's esophagus does not really depend on the severity or the frequency of reflux. It depends more on the duration of the reflux. Um, this study from an endoscopy database shows that as, you have, as your duration of reflux symptoms goes up, your risk for Barrett's esophagus goes up. And there's some suggestion that Barrett's may actually be a defense mechanism or reparative response to reflux. Patients with Barrett's will actually feel less heartburn or less reflux. And, and so it's the duration that's much more important if you're going to look for a risk factor in patients with reflux. Um, the other 
risk factor that's emerged only in the last uh, 20 years or so uh, has been obesity. And obesity initially was thought to work through a mechanism of obesity caused reflux, and reflux was thought to be the mechanism of, uh, for predisposing to cancer. And again, Lagergan did a nice population study where he looked at those with reflux and those without reflux, those with reflux, those without reflux, and, and stratifying as the uh, as BMI went up, the risk for adenocarcinoma went up independent of obesity. And since then, there's been a large number of studies that have looked at obesity as an independent risk factor. And it turns out that there's um, adenocarcinoma, the odds for um, adenocarcinoma and those who are obese is about twofold. Obesity is, again, an interesting uh, risk factor, not just for esophageal adenocarcinoma, but for a number of other adenocarcinomas, and a lot of work being done in this area, including some that we're doing, to try to understand what that mechanism is. Uh, in our study, the reason we got interested is not only is obesity predisposed to cancer, but it also seems to drive the mechanism from Barrett's to cancer. And those individuals who are obese tend to develop cancer about five years earlier than those who are not obese. Uh, the association of Barrett's with obesity is a little bit different. Barrett's, per se, is not associated with BMI. Uh, if you look at this population-based study from the West Coast, uh, as your BMI went up, your odds for Barrett's did not go up. But if you look at the pattern of obesity uh, and look at central obesity, as the waist hip ratio went up, your risk for Barrett's went up to fourfold. And this finding has been repeated now in multiple studies. So something about that metabolically active fat cells in your central adipose tissue that drive the formation of Barrett's esophagus and probably also drives the uh, progression to cancer. Um, smoking and alcohol uh, have also been considered. Smoking is a risk factor for uh, adenocarcinoma. Alcohol is not a risk factor for adenocarcinoma of esophagus. Smoking and alcohol are risk factors for squamous cell cancer, but smoking is not a risk factor for adenocarcinoma. And some suggestion that red wine may actually be protective for adenocarcinoma of esophagus. And again, smoking similarly is a risk factor for Barrett's esophagus. Is taking a large number of studies, but in this meta-analysis, smoking seems to predispose to Barrett's esophagus with a risk of uh, odd ratio of about twofold. What else is the, seems to be associated? Well, aspirin and NSAIDs seem to be protective. A large number of observational studies, nothing prospective that they drop your odd ratio down to about 0.6. And then, interestingly, uh, one of the theories uh, for why H. pylori may actually protect against uh, the development of adenocarcinoma or Barrett's esophagus is that H. pylori may actually reduce your acid production, and so it may prevent uh, as much reflux damage. It's not clearly known what that mechanism is, but H. pylori is protective against Barrett's esophagus and may protect against adenocarcinoma. So, are, in general, both these diseases are clearly environmental. The rates have gone up over the last 30 or 40 years. And in that setting, why did we start considering that there may be actually a genetic basis to it? Well, our first clue was, uh, we're just going to digress a little bit and talk about what we've been doing and then come back to screening and surveillance. It was this male and white predominance. Those are often features of something genetic going on. And, and then if you look, lots of people have reflux, lots of people have severe reflux, yet only some of them seem to develop Barrett's esophagus, suggesting there's something not just with reflux, but some susceptibility of the epithelium. And 
then over the last 20 years or so, ever since the genomic re revolution, I think we've realized that cancer and most other diseases are complex and that there's some genetic factors, some environmental factors that have an interplay and lead to the phenotype. So about uh, 20 years ago, we, or 15 years ago, we just started off by doing a simple epidemiology study, asking people their family history. And sure enough, we found that patients with Barrett's esophagus and adenocarcinoma had a greater family history of Barrett's and adenocarcinoma than reflux patients. And we started considering these as complex genetic diseases, meaning there's environmental factors that we know about, some we don't know about, and genetic factors. And, and to try to identify these patients and families, we, we had to develop a cheap method of screening these people. And this cheap method of screening may actually be applicable to the population as a whole. So around that time, the, uh, endoscope manufacturers started making thinner endoscopes. And we started considering, could you do endoscopy in people while awake? Uh, and instead of having to do it through the mouth, could you just numb their nose, numb the back of their throat? And this is just some nasal anesthetic. Those are the nasal turbinates as you're going through. Epiglottis here. You'll see the vocal cords right in there. And you can see the esophagus, and people tolerate this relatively well. We've been trying to screen people with this transnasal endoscopy, and you can see he's got a normal squamous columnar junction, does have an erosion, so he does have esophagitis, has a hiatal hernia, <laughs> and he's happy he doesn't have Barrett's esophagus. As opposed to this individual screening for a family study where you can see these reddish areas with these squamous islands where we were able to diagnose Barrett's esophagus. And, and using this technology and studying these patients, we've been collecting families that, you know, you see this one family, the blue is Barrett's esophagus, the red is adenocarcinoma, and, and it looks strikingly like there's a genetic predisposition here. <laughs> Similar other families here, the black is Barrett's, blue is cancer. And so we have been finding it in families, and over the last uh, five years, there are now reports starting to come out of genes being associated with these conditions. One of them was found with a linkage study was an MSR1, which is uh, involved in inflammation. There have been a few genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, where they found low risk, uh, um, but more common SNPs that are near transcription factors that are involved in esophageal development or inflammation. Again, both things that predispose to developing esophagitis and perhaps Barrett's. And we're working on a gene that we found in that first large family that we see that we call it E1 which appears to be involved in maturation of that stratified squamous epithelium. Now to get back to the main part of the talk, and so these are the risk factors that, in general, the epidemiology that defines Barrett's and esophageal adenocarcinoma. So how do we use that knowledge? Well, if we want to screen, we probably want to screen a selective population Perhaps white men greater than 50 would have, with reflux symptoms would have enough of a risk to warrant screening. Um, does this epidemiology explain the rising incidence of adenocarcinoma? Well, there's a number of risk factors. We know obesity has been going up, so that may be an explanation partly for why adenocarcinoma has gone, gone to the rise. Uh, 
And then the other thing we know is H. pylori has gone into rapid decline as we treat it more aggressively as we try to get rid of ulcer disease and gastric cancer. And, and with the advent of antibiotics, we, we probably saw a fall in H. pylori, and has this perhaps led to the rise in adenocarcinoma? What can we recommend for our patients with Barrett's knowing what we know? Well, one of the biggest things we can easily recommend, it gives you an opportunity to discuss weight loss with your parent and patients, uh, seizing smoking, and then try to treat their GERD in case some of that reflux is playing a role in the GERD. So it, in general, screening has not been recommended by general medical societies, but the three GI societies are trying to make some recommendations. And the older recommendation used to be for screening anyone and everyone, but those recommendations keep changing. So the American College made a recommendation in 2008 uh, acknowledging that screening is controversial because there's no data that it impacts mortality. But if you're going to screen we should screen Caucasian males age greater than 50 who have long-standing heartburn. Uh, screening in the general population we cannot recommend, but screening in the higher risk population still remains to be established, but may be reasonable. Remember, screening in, these, in this age group is going to miss at least 40%, if not 50 or 60% of those at risk. The AGA recommends screening in patients with multiple risk factors, but again, we don't have the evidence and it's a weak recommendation, and also recommends it against general screening. And the third GI Society in 2012, very similar recommendation, consider it in patients with multiple risk factors, but let the patient know that we don't have enough evidence and stop screening after you've done one negative screening endoscopy because individuals, if they don't have parents, are unlikely to develop it. So problems remain. Uh, only 5% of Barrett's esophagus is diagnosed prior to development of cancer or it's diagnosed in autopsy. As I mentioned, only 60% of patients will have significant symptoms of reflux, so if we confine our screening to reflux, we're going to miss 40%. A majority of primary care physicians are naturally not going to be aware of screening guidelines that gastroenterologists are putting out. And patient acceptance of endoscopic screening has been poor and cost has been high. So what, what are the new things that are coming up? Well, one idea is to do some kind of a non-endoscopic screening. I showed you the unsedated transnasal endoscope. That works, and patients who have it tolerate it, but there's still a barrier to getting people to have that screening done. It would make it cheaper. You can train a lot of people, but it, it, after the initial studies, the uptake's been low. And then the third has been this video capsule. This is a tiny little capsule uh, that transmits images. And the nice thing is if you swallow it, you can see the esophagus. It just transmits images as it goes down. And you can see the gastroesophageal junction as you're traversing. The sensitivity of this, the original version was about 70%. The newer version, it's probably getting up to 80%. The problem with this would be great technology, it's just expensive. And then the newest technology being proposed in the United Kingdom where it's being used for screening is just quite simple. A capsule covered in gelatin, attached to the thread, you swallow the capsule, in five, 10 minutes, this dissolves, and it leaves you with the sponge. You pull the sponge out after 10 minutes, and you look for cytologic markers of Barrett's esophagus. And the sensitivity for this particular test has been reported to be 70%, specificity of 94%. And in the UK, they've screened over 500 subjects and are trying to institute this in a screening program. It's coming to this country, whether it'll be taken up or not remains to be seen. So if we're going to impact on this disease, the first thing is we're going to have to identify the barriers which we're not doing very well. 
will have to find something that's effective and can work in primary care patients. We'll have to define the population for screening, whether it's just reflux or whether we can do it in a wider population, and establish a mentality which is accept, not just sensitive and specific, but gets accepted by patients and physicians. So that's the first challenge. Now, say you do get screened and you do identify Barrett's esophagus, what do you do next with those patients? Well, that's based on our understanding of what happened with Barrett's esophagus, and I'll talk about what the limitations are with our understanding. So initially, you've got squamous epithelium. You get reflux damage, and it develops into something that looks quite different or is Barrett's esophagus. This is non-dysplastic. The cells or nuclei are lined at the base of the epithelium. It looks like nice villi. Histologically, it appears that in some patients, Barrett's esophagus will progress to a somewhat dysplastic state where the nuclei are disordered, a little bit pleomorphic, what we call low-grade dysplasia. In some patients, not all, this low-grade dysplasia may actually go back to Barrett's or may progress. We don't know whether it's in a year and a half or four years or how long it takes but it may progress to more ugly-looking epithelium, still not cancer, but something called high-grade dysplasia. And then at high-grade dysplasia, if it's going to progress, it could progress as, as low as half a year to one and a half year, or may stay stable for many, many years, but some of these individuals are going to progress to cancer. The trouble with this understanding is it's all based on H and E, and pathology, which histology is, H&E histology is now 30, 40 years old, and the ability to diagnose or interpret dysplasia is quite difficult. Pathologists do not agree on what's low-grade dysplasia, and it's very difficult to um, make clinical decisions based on a diagnosis that's hard to interpret. So if you're going to act on something, you need to know what that risk of progression from that condition to cancer is, because cancer is ultimately what we're interested in. Now, if you look and look at old studies of the risk of Barrett's progressing to cancer, about 20 years ago, that risk was thought to be one in 50 patient years, or 50 patients followed for a year, or one would develop cancer. Ten years later, that risk had dropped about one in a hundred patient years, and then more studies were done, realized there was big um, publication bias, it dropped to one in 200 patient years. Every decade, it seems to drop by half. And in the most recent study from the New England Journal out of Denmark, uh, the risk for non-dysplastic Barrett's was somewhere around 0.1%. The reason that risk drops is we're widening our definition of Barrett's and we're widening it to a condition that has less and less risk for progression. At 0.1% per year, you may argue that it may not even be a condition worth surveying. Risk for low-grade dysplasia in this study, and low-grade dysplasia is the lesion that's hardest for pathologists to identify. The risk for low-grade dysplasia in this study was about 0.5% per year, uh, per patient year, and most of the risk seemed to be early in the diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia. As opposed to others, this study from a multi-center group in the United States followed about 156 patients with low-grade dysplasia for about four years. If you notice, with low-grade dysplasia, about two-thirds of them regressed without any intervention. About one-fifth of them just persisted with low-grade dysplasia for four years. Uh, only a small subset progressed to high-grade dysplasia and cancer. So is this a condition that needs to be surveyed frequently? Is this a condition that needs action? H hard to determine. Part that becomes confusing, and again, this is a problem with how you define pathology and how you interpret it, is there's a, a contradictory study out of Amsterdam, and, and this was just published in JAMA, 
and in this group, they had three pathologists, and all three pathologists evaluated the low-grade dysplasia, and all three pathologists had to agree on it being low-grade dysplasia. And one, three pathologists had to agree half the cases of low-grade dysplasia were thrown out. So in some selected low-grade dysplasia, they had 27% of patients who were not treated progressed to cancer in three years of follow-up. Now that started becoming significant of 9% of your select low-grade dysplasia group is progressing to cancer. Then you can do something, and, and that's a population worth surveying and worth acting on. Um, they ablated the other arm and radio frequency ablation, which we'll get to, seem to prevent progression to cancer, but didn't prevent it completely. And the diagnosis that is actionable is high-grade dysplasia. The risk of high-grade dysplasia to cancer hasn't been studied in a lot of studies because we typically don't follow these individuals very long because they are at high risk for progression. And the small amount of data that we have, it seems to be about uh, one in 10 patients per year will progress from high-grade dysplasia to cancer. So the prior recommendation with high-grade dysplasia was to consider surgery and esophagectomy. And we'll talk about some of the newer treatments that we're employing trying to prevent these from progressing to cancer. So given the difficult understanding of the natural history, what do we recommend for endoscopic surveillance? Well, the most important thing is to carefully look at the area of Barrett's esophagus, biopsy anything that remotely looks abnormal, and do lots of biopsies to identify um, uh, dysplasia. Again, the three societies recommend roughly the same surveillance interval. All of them recommend that the dysplasia should be confirmed by at least two pathologists if you're going to act on it. And the grade of dysplasia determines appropriate surveillance intervals. All of this is based strictly in modeling and cost considerations. So for non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, the ACG recommends every three years after two normal endoscopies, uh, that after two endoscopies that show non-dysplastic barriers. And the reason for doing two endoscopies is after your initial endoscopy, if you miss dysplasia, the second endoscopy may identify it. If you have low-grade dysplasia, then repeat an endoscopy in six months to make sure it's not high-grade and survey those individuals a little more closely at one year. And with high-grade dysplasia, uh, we no longer survey them. We either resect it or perform endoscopic therapy. AGA, a little more recently, again, weak recommendation for surveillance and somewhat similar surveillance intervals. Their interval for non-dysplastic barracks can be up to five years, recognizing that the risk of progression may be very low. And ASGE, again, only surveyed those who are candidates for intervention. Now, since the interventions are becoming easier, you, you can no longer say that an 80-year-old or 85-year-old may not be a candidate for intervention. Um, but always confirm the diagnosis of dysplasia and similar surveillance intervals. Is surveillance effective? That remains to be seen. All of these are or are not prospective studies, and they only look at patients discovered under surveillance versus those discovered without surveillance, but they're all subject to lead time bias. In these studies, it's seen that those with cancer discovered under surveillance do um, have longer survival than those discovered outside surveillance. But the only good study we have was published last year, which is a case control study, and this leads to question our entire strategy for screening and surveillance. And Doug Corley in the Kaiser uh, population looked at 38 cases that had died from cancer and compared to 101 controls from within the same population and found that surveillance within three years was not associated with mortality. Now, some of the problems with the surveillance may have been that some of those patients were not being surveyed as recommended, 
and there was also treatment associated mortality when you discovered the cancer. But our whole premise for doing screening and surveillance has been thrown into question. There are some studies coming out now that may contradict this, but uh, again, we need to have a healthy dose of, of skepticism for all we do. So not only is screening problematic, surveillance is problematic. One, cancer and dysplasia can be very patchy and we may miss them when we're doing endoscopy. Compliance with doing extensive biopsy is, is difficult and surveillance intervals are not well defined. So a lot of research going in to try to develop better methods for imaging, high magnification, trying to color the areas of dysplasia. This is blue light endoscopy or narrowband imaging where you may pick up the area of dysplasia. Optical coherence tomography, something that we were working and developing is now available commercially, but not clear that any of these methods are going to help. And so far, nothing has come into clinical practice. All of these novel imaging technologies will have to be not only clinical effective, but they'll have to be inexpensive because this is still not a very common disease. They'll need to be such that we can train endoscopists in the community. It, it, they cannot be difficult to apply into practice. And what we're trying to do is obviate the need for this imaging technology, but maybe look towards genetics for molecular biomarkers that may predict those who are at risk for progression. And maybe that's where the hope lies. So in the last 10 minutes, let me try to go quickly through some of the advances that have been made in this disease and something that is making a difference. And that is when we diagnose high-grade dysplasia and perhaps low-grade dysplasia. We, we are able to address that. And in 20 years, 15 years ago, whereas we used to send these patients for esophageal surgery and esophagectomy, which had its own mortality and morbidity, we now can do things to try to get rid of this superficial mucosal layer and leave the muscle intact. One technique we've developed is called mucosal resection, which is like removing a polyp. And the advantage of that technique is we get a specimen for pathology that lets us look at the deep margin and tell if the high-grade dysplasia has cancer that's developed or not. And it's very uh, easy to apply minimal side effects. The difficult part with mucosal resection is if you try to take out circumferential barrets, you leave a stricture in the patient, so it's a technique that can only be applied for focal high-grade dysplasia. Started originally as with our regular snares and trying to lift the mucosa and cut it, and now it's involved into two different techniques. One, we put it, this is the area we want to resect. We inject that area and then we put a white cap on the tip of our endoscope, put a snare around the cap, and then we take that flat area of Barrett's and suck it up and make it into a polyp. And as long as we've separated the mucosa out, we can snare this whole area out. So it has to be a localized area with high-grade dysplasia and you leave the muscle intact underneath that area. That technique has largely been replaced now by an easier method. These are the BAM ligators we, use, we still use for varices and someone realized that you can use the BAM ligator to form the same polyp put a snare down through that area and remove this pseudopolyp that you've created. And you can resect areas of Barrett's esophagus. So now it's possible to take areas such as this, which has high-grade dysplasia right at the gastroesophageal junction, high-grade narrowband imaging to define the borders of that area, resected in two pieces, contiguous pieces, 
and then you go back a few months later, and it's been replaced by normal, or it's, uh, normal squamous epithelium. You can use that technique not just for Barrett's, for, but for very early cancer, as long as it's well differentiated, really pioneered by the Germans, uh, showing nicely that the survival, even with early cancer, is as good, if not better, than surgery. The other technique that has developed has been to deal with diffuse circumferential high-grade dysplasia called radiofrequency ablation. Now, ablation can be done by a variety of methods, and it was discovered um, in Arizona uh, that if you just injure the mucosa and submucosa by any means, whether heat, cautery, uh, uh, and, and you allow it to heal, for some reason, the normal squamous epithelium comes back. It doesn't make any sense because Barrett's formed because there was injury to the esophagus and, and the body repaired it by forming Barrett's. But you injure it again and you give them a proton pump inhibitor, an intensive proton pump inhibitor, and for whatever reason, the body decides to go back to the squamous uh, mucosa. And this was a technique um, Nick Shaheen led a um, multi-center study that was published in the England Journal. And just to show you what the technique is, um, the engineers developed this balloon. You put the balloon over the esophagus to size it. Then there's a three centimeter array with electrodes mounted at the tip of that balloon. You put down the appropriate size electrode. Watch it with endoscopy, step on a pedal. It delivers the exact right amount of energy designed to just injure to a certain depth and not beyond. You form this coagulum. The coagulum has to be scraped off. And then you repeat the process a second time. Scrape off the coagulum. And then repeat it to get down to the submucosa. The thought is the Barrett's glands are down in the submucosal region. And then you go back a few months later, find most of that Barrett's is healed and replaced by squamous epithelium. There's a few areas that are left. And you have a different paddle that you can just burn those areas with. And then after four or five sessions, in about 80% of the patients, you can completely or endoscopically completely replace the area with squamous epithelium. In the New England Journal trial uh, that Nick published, we had 43 patients with high-grade dysplasia. And the radiofrequency arm, we got rid of high-grade dysplasia and intention to treat arm in about 80% of the patients as opposed to 11% in the sham arm. And similarly got rid of all Barrett's intestinal metaplasia and high-grade dysplasia in about 77% of patients. The real results in practice have not been as good, but still a major advance in our ability to prevent high-grade dysplasia from progression. The third is something called cryotherapy, which has been around a lot longer depends on giving patients frostbite. And this is a technique, those of you who know John Dumont has been one of the pioneers in this technique. Uh, it does involve delivering liquid nitrogen. When you deliver liquid nitrogen, it causes a lot of gas, so the stomach blows up, so you have to have the ability to get rid of that gas. This is the probe that delivers the liquid nitrogen. You can see the whole probe is getting frozen. Your scope gets frozen as you're delivering this. But if you have an area of dysplasia that you can see, you just freeze that area, count to 20, 20 second once, 20 second twice, and then look back at it and 
the area is often eradicated, similar to radio frequency ablation, just not as much control. So this particular treatment has some advantages in people who are failing radio frequency ablation. You can also treat uneven surfaces. It doesn't cause quite as much pain as the radio frequency ablation. So the third modality. Now, anything that has three modalities treated, it means none of the modalities work effectively. If one of them works totally effectively, you would only have one modality. And the problem is that regardless of what you do, whether it's mucosal resection, whether it's radiofrequency ablation, or whether it's cryotherapy, it looks good, but there are glands of Barrett's esophagus that remain buried underneath the squamous esophagus. And those glands with time in a proportion of those patients can progress the cancer and become uh, subsquamous cancer, which can be hard to detect. So even though endoscopic therapy has been advanced and prevents cancer in a majority of patients, it's not foolproof, and all these patients need continued close surveillance after the therapy. And the therapy involves multiple sessions of endoscopy, but it's better than esophagectomy, which had a high morbidity and a mortality. So what advances have we made in this disease is really ablation therapy, it eradicates high rate dysplasia and up to 80%. So those 20% who don't get eradicated still end up with surgery. <laughs> Cancer still can develop, so we have to follow these patients very closely. Um, maybe someday we'll have a single session endoscopic therapy, um, perhaps with growth factors that will completely prevent it, but we're not there yet. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Really cool stuff. Questions for Dr. Shock? Dr. Bosser? Um, just a quick question. You mentioned that a lot of patients, as you know, end up on PPIs either when they leave the hospital or they're on them as, you know, part of whatever their medication regimen may be. And sometimes it becomes very difficult to gauge the symptomology for patients as they're progressing because once they're on that PPI, they just tend to stay on it forever. And so in terms of who do you recommend for further screening versus not, is there some algorithm or some for, recommendation for, or should you, you know? Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> PPIs are so easy to use and they're terribly overused. Yeah. And, and, and it's hard to get patients off of it. All the patients are, themselves are becoming cognizant of the risk, perhaps, of hip fractures, et cetera. Um, of those who I would recommend screening are just the white men who've had it for over 50 years and are otherwise relatively healthy, are, are probably the ones who should get screening endoscopy, or those who've had reflux for 10, 20 years. Um, again, more in the white men, but because a lot of times they've been on PPIs for 10, 20 years, whether they really should have been on it or not is, is a very different question. No, but no. Most of them probably don't, shouldn't be on it. And, and PPIs, per se, there's been this question, do they help in Barrett's and progression? Um, there's some observational studies, but they're all flawed that say the risk of dysplasia is less in people with PPIs. The reason they're flawed is PPIs cause suppressed inflammation and dysplasia and inflammation can be confused. Um, with endoscopic, the high-grade dysplasia is where you're doing endoscopic therapy. If you don't have those people on PPIs and fairly intense PPIs, the Barrett's that comes back. So those are the only pe people where there's a benefit. In the regular Barrett's asymptomatic group, is there any benefit to PPIs? Not, even if you have a diagnosis, even if you screen them and you have Barrett's, should you have them on it, should you not have them on it is, is controversial. Most of the time, by the time those patients get screened, they think that they're it's very hard to explain to patients that the fact that they're not having heartburn doesn't mean that their risk of cancer has gone down. And they always think the reason you're doing their endoscopy is because they're having heartburn. And trying to separate the two is, is very difficult and challenging. Thank you.
other questions? So when the patient's been in the hospital a long time, and we're sending them to a nursing home, and they're on a PPI, before we send them, we should question them. We should question why they're on the PPI. It's one of the questions that I can answer. Very much so. Okay, good. Uh, if there's no further questions, I want to thank Dr. Chalk for a fantastic presentation. <laughs>